Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Orange County School Board's regularly scheduled meeting this Tuesday, October 26th, 2021. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Board members are participating in person or telephonically. I believe we are all here in the chambers except for Member Gallo. Member Gallo, are you on the call with us? All right, I do not hear Member Gallo. If we, um, Dr. Jenkins or Ms. Anvall, if either one of you hear from um, Ms. Gallo and I'm not aware that she's dialed in, let me know so I can recognize her. As a reminder, face masks are required indoors um, on all school property, and that includes the board chambers and our lobby. I want to remind the public that board members will not be engaging in outside electronic or digital communication during the meeting, so we can focus on the meeting itself. To my fellow board members, district members, district staff, and members of the public, when speaking, please make sure that the microphone is turned on and speak directly in it to, so that our YouTube and Orange TV viewers can hear you clearly. And again, thank you so much for participating or attending this evening's meeting. We're going to begin with a moment of silence, but before the moment of silence, I want to call on Member Felder to make a few comments, and then Member Felder, if you will lead us in a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. <coughs> Person Jacobs. <clears throat> Wilhelmina Unkefer was a dedicated teacher and elementary guidance counselor since 1966. During her tenure, she worked as a guidance counselor under Dr. Kat Gordon, and together they lobbied for and convinced the district to create a division of elementary counselors. She loved her work helping young parents and their children. We at this board in Orange County Public School District, we are sharing along with the grief with her family members and we offer our condolences. Tremaine Lee was a beloved member of the Sattler family for 10 years. <clears throat> During his time at Sattler, he served as a classroom teacher interventionist and STEM lab teacher. He was a dedicated teacher who loved his profession and made learning come alive for students. He has left a lasting impact on our Sattler community and we will all miss him more than words can express. We are especially saddened by his passing, both his parents, his mother, and his father both worked for the district, so we offer to the Lee family our sincere condolences, and we are praying for your strength. At this time, if you will stand for a moment of silent meditation, after which we will say the Pledge of Allegiance. And now the Pledge. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation founded by indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Member Felder. Dr. Jenkins, do we have any recognitions today? We do, Madam Chair, and let me also note Member Gallo is on uh, the line. She says she can hear us, but um, potentially we are not able to hear her, but she is on the line. All right. Welcome, Member Gallo. I've Thank got two um, recognitions. Uh, first, Andrea Denise Hale, who is an instructional coach at Orlando Gifted Academy, will be the new assistant principal for Orlando Gifted Academy. And then I have uh, Cannon Cameron, who is a program specialist for ESE Transitions, will be the new assistant principal for our ESE Transition School. That is it, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. We also have a number of proclamations. This is always a, um, a busy time of the year for proclamations, so bear with me. First, we are proclaiming October 23rd to the 31st as Red Ribbon Week here in Orange County Public Schools. And I'm going to ask if Miss Mary Bridges would come forward to read the proclamation and to announce the winning schools and students. Miss Bridges, thank you for being here with us. And Miss Warner, thank you for being here with us as well. Good evening, Chair Jacobs. Superintendent Jenkins and school board members. I am honored to speak to you this evening celebrating Red Ribbon Week, which is this week, October 23rd through October 31st. Now I'd like to introduce Sharon Warner, representing Informed Families for Red Ribbon Certified Schools. 
Good evening. Red Ribbon is the nation's oldest and largest drug prevention awareness program. Red Ribbon Week started after the death of DEA Administration Special Agent Kiki Camarino, who was murdered in 1985. After his death, people began to wear red ribbons to honor his, his sacrifice. Today, millions of people celebrate Red Ribbon Week by wearing red ribbons and participating in community anti-drug events and pledging to live drug-free lives. As you can see, this is taking place right now throughout Orange County. In 1988, the National Family Partnership, which is, we are a part of Informed Families, sponsored the first National Red Ribbon Campaign. Today, red ribbons serve as a catalyst to mobilize communities and educate youth and encourage participation in drug prevention activities. Since that time, the campaign has reached millions of children and families. The National Family Partnership and its network of individuals and organizations continue to, to deliver this message every year. Today, I would like to recognize Arbor Ridge K-8 School Principal Vanessa DeMars and the application lead, Ms. Mary Jackson, who could not be with us this evening for their efforts in becoming a Red Ribbon Certified School. Freedom Middle School, Principal Sherry Levitt, or Ms. Godak, <laughs> um, and Lancaster Elementary School, Ms. Natasha Pender. Application lead, their parent engagement liaison, Ms. Elizabeth Rodriguez. It has been a pleasure to work with you all over the last couple of years on your Red Ribbon Certified School certification. We would, we would also like to recognize students that won awards in essay and poem contest and poster contest. We had first, second, and third place in all of these, and I'm just going to read your first place winners, um, but we will be posting on social media the others. So for the essay and poem contest for elementary, Ileana Caswell from Bay Lake Elementary School, middle school, Ashley Reaney from Freedom Middle School, and high school, Katherine Tang from Windermere High School. For the poster contest for elementary, Jariah Finklia from Rock Lake Elementary, Christy J. Uh, J. Duong from Apopka Memorial Middle School, and Jade Kratzer from Boone High School. In addition to the contest for students, OCPS partners with the Orange County Drug-Free Coalition and provides an opportunity for Orange County Elementary and Middle Schools to apply for funding to support their Red Ribbon Week and year-long drug-free efforts. This year, the elementary winner was Little River Elementary School, and the middle school winner was a Popka Middle School, so they received $500 each to have red ribbon activities throughout the year. Congratulations to all our winners. We look forward to all OCPS schools participating in several Red Ribbon Week events this week to celebrate that drug-free looks like me. Oh, Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Ms. Bridges, for the wonderful work you do. And let me just take a moment to uh, publicly thank Sharon Warner. She does so much here for Orange County Public Schools. And currently, for those of you who might not know, she is serving on our K-12 Mental Health Commission. And she is also serving on our Reapportionment Advisory Committee. So she has her plate very full. And um, that's, only, that's only a fraction of what she does to support our, our students every single day. Thanks, Sharon. All right, um, we are also proclaiming October 28th as National First Responders Day in Orange County Public Schools. November 21st is National Family Engagement Month. November 2021 as Native American Heritage Month. November 6th through the 13th as Week of the Family in Orange County Public Schools. November 8th through the 12th as National Psychology Awareness Week. Pro we're proclaiming November 15th through the 21st as National Apprenticeship, I can say this word, National Apprenticeship Week in Orange County Public Schools. And if I can pause here for a minute to see if Ms. Dr. Stefanowicz is with us, wonderful. If you could come forward, we would greatly appreciate it if you would read the proclamation. There you go, smart. <laughs> okay, we don't know that, I apologize. <laughs> Always have to find a little bit of humor. Good <laughs> evening, School Board Chair Jacobs, members of the board, Dr. Jenkins. Um, it, excuse me, it is my honor to be here tonight to share with you Registered Apprenticeship Week. It is Orange County Public Schools and Orange Technical Colleges desire to support the state initiative of being number one in workforce development by 2030. 
One significant way we support that goal is through registered apprenticeship. Registered apprenticeship is an employer-driven education and training solution that provides structured on-the-job training and instruction to apprenticeships for specific occupations and culminates in a nationally recognized portable completion certificate issued by the Department of Education. It is my honor today to introduce you to Mr. Steve Paroli, who is, excuse me, for some reason I'm nervous, I think it was, I couldn't get that thing open. <laughs> Mr. Paroli has been with the Florida Education Apprenticeship Training Program in Orange County for almost 30 years, and he is the backbone of our FEET program, and he will be sharing the proclamation for you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Again, I'm Steve Paroli. I'm with Orange Technical College Mid-Florida Campus. Uh, and I've been with the electrical apprenticeship program for 31 years and I'm a, a school teacher. Uh, we teach two nights a week in our program and I've been teaching for 31 years. So tonight I uh, thank you for having us again, uh, school board members. Uh, proclamation, National Apprenticeship Week. Whereas November 15th to 21st, 2021 has been designated National Apprenticeship Week, a nationwide celebration that gives businesses, communities, and educators the opportunity to showcase their apprenticeship programs and apprentices while providing valuable information to career seekers and, whereas now in its seventh year, National Apprenticeship Week will bring together registered apprenticeship programs from across Central Florida via Orange County Public Schools Career and Technical Education to bring awareness to the local community via program offerings, recruitment opportunities, virtual skill shops, guest speakers, and more, and whereas Orange County Public Schools offers over 15 apprenticeship programs across multiple Orange Technical College campuses in various in-demand career fields like building construction, heating, air conditioning, and refrigeration, brick and block masonry, carpentry, child care, health care, electricity, plumbing, and more. And whereas the mission of each apprenticeship program is to provide an atmosphere of unified learning and skills development through classroom instruction and on-the-job experience, assuring a lifelong earning opportunity. And whereas apprenticeship programs combine paid employment with no cost technical training. Completing each year of training elevates apprentices hourly pay rate and status within the skilled trade community. Upon completing the apprenticeship program, an apprentice becomes a journeyman or master of the craft. And whereas, unlike other career training programs offered, apprentices are selected to participate by employers, sponsors, based on criteria specifically defined in standards of registered apprenticeship programs approved by the U.S. Department of Labor and the Florida Department of Education. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the School Board of Orange County, Florida does hereby pro proclaim November 15 to 21st, 2021 as National Apprenticeship Week in Orange County Public Schools. Thank you, sir, and thank you for your 30, 31 years, was it? 31 years, yes. Congratulations and thank you. Got two to go. No, it's, no, 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 no. My, my boss don't want me to leave. No, we, I Thank don't you. want you to leave. None of us want you to leave. <laughs> All right, let's hear from Vice Chair. Well, I, you know, um, I think that the CTE training and especially the ability to feature these apprenticeship programs is absolutely amazing. And, and essential to highlight the opportunities of our uh, K-12 and post-secondary students. Um, that we've made so many strides since I joined the board on this and I wanna commend the entire team on that, uh, Dr. Jenkins and, and her leadership and, and what has been continued to be expanded. And I can't wait to hear what's next and I know that we're opening more and more doors not only in the the traditional things, um, some of which were outlined, but things like with CFX and transportation opportunities, modeling and simulation, computers. Um, if you can think of it, we probably train it if there's a good job out there for it. So it's really a phenomenal opportunity to get that experiential learning and get 
get our young people excited about the curriculum that they're learning. So thank you. Excellent point. Don't disappear yet. Um, Member Felder. Thank you, Chairman uh, Jacobs. I am have been for all of my life a, a proponent in support of career education. My father owned a dry cleaning business and he taught students from Jones how to dry clothes and how to be, be able to start their own businesses. And when I had an opportunity to visit Orange Technical School, I was just mesmerized. So every time I hear of the programs and apprenticeships that you all are doing, I am just so excited. It's one of my schools. It's a poor frog that wouldn't praise his own pond. But I am <laughs> so excited. Yes, I, I'm excited. And so I look forward because I know uh, it's going to be opportunity for people in our uh, communities that may not necessarily have an opportunity to uh, become economically uh, independent because they don't have a skill. But here we offer a skill. They can uh, own their own businesses. And it just it means a lot, especially for people of color and other people. But I know specifically uh, where the school is located and just the work you do and what the schools offer in the area of uh, technical education, I'm telling you, I am just proud and I'm so happy. And I look forward to seeing the students and coming out again to see the work that you're doing and thank you so much. Member Felder, I should um, apologize for the chuckle up here on the board or at least explain it. So I had never heard that phrase, um, oh, yeah. that uh, yes, a poor frog that doesn't praise its own pond. Believe oh, it or not, I had not heard it, but Cat <laughs> Gordon, bear, sweetheart, there was barely a meeting that would go by that she would not remind us. So when you said it, it just brought back some warm feelings from all of us. Uh, yes, yes. So anyway, that was what we all, yeah, we all just had a, a flashback to Kat always reminding us that. So anyway, in, in, in the most, um, in the most pleasant of ways. So don't take offense to our laughter. Um, Member Bird. Thank you, Chair. Um, I actually have two things that I want to, um, talk about tonight but first I'll just tag on to the um, to the uh, apprenticeship week um, proclamation and how much um, how much that means to me as well personally I too had um, a father who was just a high school graduate actually from Winter Park High School in 1959 um, but he uh, was a general contractor and spent his entire life um, as a building contractor, building buildings all over Orlando, and which is really great because I can drive around and s see the work that he did still to this day. But um, but he provided a terrific life for a family of six f with four children, and um, you know sent us to college and everything, and all of that without a college degree. Um, not to say that a college degree is not great, but we all know that some kids. Um, are excited get excited when they get to use their hands or when they get to um, do something that they can that they can build or see an end result. So I, I just I love that we have so many opportunities here in Orange County Public Schools and that we encourage children to explore the possibilities of what's out there and um, and there's a lot of really great careers that um, are we are in desperate need to fill. So I I'm thrilled that we are allowing our students to the opportunity to experience those. Um, I also wanted to just take a quick second to um, to talk about our our proclamation for um, Native American Native American what yes heritage month. We did the whole month. Yes. Okay. I was <laughs> just wondering if it was a week or a month. Um, yes, because a very dear friend of mine. Um, actually uh, is a, uh, she's a paraprofessional in Orange County Public Schools too, but I've been friends with her for many, many, many years. And she's a wonderful person. And she is from the Choctaw um, heritage. And she shared with me an email that she sent to her staff at her school um, 
talking about how important this is, this recognition, and Indigenous Peoples Day. And I just wanted to read a little snippet because I think sometimes um, we run through these proclamations and we don't realize how much it really means to some of the people within our district to be able to have this small little recognition that just shows that they matter and that they're an important part of the tapestry that is our very diverse district. So um, she says in this email, this is an opportunity to, com to commemorate the contributions of Native Americans along with their culture and traditions. Many students don't even realize that there are still Native Americans or that there are over 500 sovereign nations within the United States. Many of these nations are thriving and taking care of their tribal members. Without teaching the youth, the history, language, and traditions are at risk of disappearing. Much has been lost already. My grandmother was full-blood Choctaw. She was proud of her heritage and made great contributions in her lifetime. My great uncle was a code talker during World War II using the Choctaw language to send messages that could not be understood by the enemy. Like many, my grandmother's children were not so proud of their heritage. Due to the prevalent racism, they tried to hide their heritage. Many were not interested in learning the language or traditions of their people. I'm happy that today my children are proud of their Choctaw heritage. They are all tribal members of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. My daughters are learning the Choctaw language and they all participate in community cultural meetings. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to just um, thank the district leaders that um, put these proclamations together. Um, sometimes we bring them to them, sometimes they um, bring them to us, but I, I'm so thankful that we get to recognize all the important people that um, make up this great district. Thank you. Member Bird, thank you so much for those yeah. words of wisdom for us. Um, I also, while we're on that subject, you made me think of something, an email that I received just the other day, and ironically, it came right after I was, I was at Publix, and I was getting my booster um, vaccine, my COVID booster vaccine. I was really excited about that, and was waiting in line, and um, a woman approached me, and she was a proud bus driver for Orange County Public Schools. She drives um, a bus for our ESC students, <coughs> which... Um, make me even prouder of her. And we had an opportunity to visit and talk a little bit about just how I had an opportunity to share with her how important her job was and how much we appreciated it and knew it and how very difficult it's been this year because of the shortage and, and bus drivers doing double duty. And, but she was so gracious and, um, and, and felt very good about what she did. And I actually had to kind of pry it out of her had she ever had to, to do a double, you know, a double round and Anyway, she's the kind of people that we want to, are unsung heroes. So ironically, the day after that, and I do think it's ironic, I don't think it's connected, I received a, an email from a constituent who asked us, since we celebrate a lot of proclamations here, why don't we celebrate Bus Driver Appreciation Day? And I was like, okay, we need to be celebrating our bus drivers. Um, so I reached out to Scott to ask um, Mr. Howitt if we could bring a proclamation forward. There's actually a National Bus Drivers Day, and I think it was in October. But he, get, he responded back to me instantly, saying that the Foundation for Orange County Public Schools will be rolling out a four-week bus driver appreciation program starting next week. Our bus operators deserve our appreciation for all they do for our students. So I wanted to share that with you because I didn't know about this upcoming um, celebration. I'm anxious for the foundation to uh, share with each of us, and this is an invitation for the foundation to please let each board member know what they're doing um, and what might be happening in your district. I know we, we celebrate our crossing guards, and we should, and we should celebrate everybody who plays a role in Orange County Public Schools, but it especially um, hit me this year because of the huge challenge and the huge effort that our bus drivers have had to put forward for us this year. So anyway, thank you for focusing us on um, our Indian um, American heritage and how important our Native Americans are. I, as a teenager, I always regretted, it's uh, gonna sound crazy, I always regretted that I wasn't Indian. I felt like I should be. And so it surprises me because I never realized how much racism there was 
until now. Mm -hmm. and, and now I look and I see what I never saw. And it's shocking to me, just shocking. When you look at our history, the whole thing is just mm -hmm. shocking. So anyway, I'm glad we are celebrating and recognizing that Im important heritage and the unfortunate history of our nation also we need to always remember. We are finished with our proclamations. Dr. Jenkins, I'm going to call on you to introduce our strategic plan. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. It is that time of year we are required statutorily to provide a school safety update in a public meeting. Uh, I'd like to remind both members of the public and um, the board, uh, and the board is clearly aware of this, that we will not uh, by design disclose all of our safety measures. Some of them are held confidential as an added layer of security. Nonetheless, we will provide uh, significant information for our school safety update by your school safety specialist, Chief Brian Holmes, who is the chief of our own small sworn uh, police department here in Orange County Public Schools. Chief Holmes. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Jenkins. Uh, yes, tonight is the night for the school safety specialist annual update. Uh, just for a little background for those of you that are not familiar with uh, why we're doing this is post Parkland school shooting tragedy back in 2018, the legislature got together very quickly and put together Senate Bill 7026. And as part of that, they designated a position called the school safety specialist. And uh, Dr. Jenkins, as the superintendent, uh, was required by law to appoint a person to be the school safety specialist for the district who is responsible for all school safety and security personnel policies, procedures for all public schools. With that in mind, uh, we are required again to annually update the school board uh, in a publicly advertised meeting on matters associated with the safety and security of schools. As Dr. Jenkins said, I'm not going to go into great detail. This will be a high level overview of our uh, safety and security and emergency management program programming we have here at Orange County Public Schools. But I think uh, by the end of the presentation, uh, uh, most uh, people will be probably surprised about how much work uh, is being done and has been done. Uh, before I move forward, I do want to credit our past school board our current school board and our superintendent for their leadership and their willingness to put their money where their mouth is, to be committed to school safety and security. Um, as I look over my shoulder, I look back when I started here, we had Safe Havens International come in. It's a security um, assessment team that did a complete assessment of our school district. Uh, they made several recommendations of what uh, what this district could do to improve its safety and security programming. Uh, the board got behind it. They adopted several of them. Then what do we have? We had Stoneman Douglas happen. So we go back to Sandy Hook. That's 2014. Board gets on board, brings them in. And then what we have? We had what happened at Stoneman Douglas. They brought Safe Havens back and gave us a reassessment and gave us a very good passing grade. They said great things about this is where you were, this is where you're at, and this is where we think you ought to continue. Had we not had that done, we would not have been, been positioned to be able to carry out all the things that I'm gonna talk about here tonight. Um, so that said, here's the agenda. I'll start talking about Stoneland Douglas. We got Senate Bill 7026 and Senate, Senate Bill 7030. Uh, I'm going to go over our school security improvements, new legislation, the FDOE rule, uh, and uh, the findings, recommendations, and I want to talk a little bit about the grant funding we received and how we've been spending it. So just so you can follow along, this entire program is built around security strategies. We try to be strategic here in the district and all that we do. So there's three strategies that we base everything that we're doing on. Prevention and early intervention. Threat assessment's a good example about, about that. I'll go into more detail about threat assessment. Uh, threats to self, de-escalation, and our safety screening program we have. That's a great, those are great examples of prevention and preventive measures. Risk mitigation, what are we gonna do if something's happening? We, uh, we, get, we need to train for that. So we have risk mitigation drills. 
active assailant training, emergency preparedness training, things of that nature. And then last but not least, and we hope we never have to get to this, but that emergency response and recovery phase where we have our uh, SRO program and our SROs in all of our schools, our CERT teams that we have in our schools, and of course uh, re our reunification uh, program that we have prepared in the event something bad does happen at our schools. So here are the area prioritizations and how this is broke down. Of course, we have district police, which is police and security. We have safety and emergency management uh, that oversees the emergency operations, that, that preparedness piece I just mentioned. We have facility services. We wouldn't be able to do these physical security improvements without them. And then we have, of course, student services, which is our mental health team. And, you know, just, just to kind of frame this up, we are the big orange. And it, there's a lot. I would not be able to do this if I didn't have this great team uh, working with me. I have my school safety and security administrators that work with me on this on a day-in, day-out basis and help us comply with Stoneman Douglas and all of its uh, requirements. Our asset protection team, electronic security systems unit, the information analysis units, our legal services, go legal. And uh, of course, our communications division that uh, puts out all those connect orange messages and things of that nature. So there's a lot of people involved in this to make this happen on a day in day out basis. And uh, to be frank with you, I'm very proud to serve with all of them. So let me talk about how we've got this set up. I've got it set up. I have actions taken and actions that we've planned or are being put in place as we speak. Now you can see the way this year is set up. We've got 2021, uh, um, you know, so I've got to cover what we've done in 2021. And then of course we've got 21, 22 coming up here as well. So I'm gonna to try to cover all that and make, uh, help it make sense for everybody. So let's talk real briefly about the safe school officers in our schools. Back in 2021, an action taken was we had at least one SSO assigned to each school. Well, what's an SSO? Well, that's either an SRO, a school resource officer. Uh, it could be a school safety officer. I'm considered a school safety officer in my team, or it can be a guardian. So the statute used that to describe that and to fill that position in school. You have to have at least one in school for school to be in session, no matter what. So I have some numbers on that. If I get questioned about it later, I can talk about it. But with that said, that's how that works. Uh, actions planned for 21-22, we're just going to continue staffing as we do. And more importantly, we just continue our oversight with our charter schools. Occasionally we have uh, some vacancies that uh, come up and uh, we want to make sure that we have no vacancies in our schools or our charter schools and we're always prepared to backfill that if we need to. Let's talk about threat assessment teams. We were required to stand up a threat assessment team in every school. Threat assessment, threat ass the threat assessment teams uh, uh, are made up of a school administrator, an instructional position, a mental health designee, and an SRO. And it has to have an SRO. It can't be filled with a guardian. It has to be filled with uh, a law enforcement officer. Uh, so I love to say this, prevention and early intervention starts with threat assessment. I've always referred to this as the missing link in school security. You've got a team of people that if a student were to make a threat, they assess that threat and then help that student resolve that threat. It's really important because students occasionally have these, you know, problems and issues in their lives. They're having a hard time dealing with a certain situation. And the whole idea with that whole programming is not discipline, even though there can be a piece of that, but how that student can be helped to resolve that threat and what are we gonna do about it. We also have a district threat assessment team that oversees that entire program and make sure that we're consistent with how we uh, assess these threats and apply uh, you know, certain aspects to it, what type of threat it is, what level of threat it is. So uh, that's made up of uh, an administrator, school safety and security, district police commander, intel analyst, legal services, a mental health designee, an area administrators, and or an ESC representative. So you can see there's a lot of layers to this, checks and balances built in to make sure that we have safe schools.
talk about our mental health services. You know, we have issues with threat to self. So our mental health services has been, you know, very involved in uh, making sure that we comply with not only Stoneman Douglas, but some of this upcoming legislation I'm going to talk about in a little bit. So some of the actions taken during 2021 has been that whole collaboration with Mobile Crisis 211 to de-escalate our students before law enforcement's actually involved in that Baker Act process. It's all about the de-escalation. It's very helpful, and uh, they're really good at it. Our mental health designees working with 211, it's going well. Actions planned for 21-22, uh, Senate Bill 590 is requiring a parental notification and add it, and that has been added to our OCPS flow chart. So we have a flow chart. How are you gonna handle this in a school? We develop flow charts, process plans, so to speak. This is how you do it, and we wanna make sure it's enterprise-wide. All of our schools are doing it the same. You'll see that that's a consistent uh, way we try to do business here. Everyone's doing it the same in every school. Uh, parent acknowledgement form has been modified to document parental contact prior to removal for the Baker Act. Our crisis hotline information stickers have been provided for our six through 12 schools to be affixed to the back. And um, that's pretty much for this school year. Let's talk a little bit about our safety and emergency management team and some of the responsibilities to uh, you know, stay up with all this. And believe me, it drives us and it drives us hard. When you've got Senate bills, uh, you've got rules, you have all this, it makes you work. You've got to keep up with this compliance. And, um, and, and we work hard at doing that. So some of the actions taken for 2021 is they incorporated the COVID-19 safety pro protocols into our emergency drill procedures. As you might imagine, we wouldn't want to cluster everybody in a corner together when we're trying to deal with, with COVID. So they came up with some procedures for that. They updated and maintained our health and safety protocols manual. That was a living document we had right there on the OCPS website. You could look at it. Parent had questions about what's going on with the protocol. Just go right to our website. They updated our emergency procedures manual and they updated our standard response protocol terminology. We added, um, we have lockdown, lockout, evacuate, shelter, and hold. So we added, uh, uh, we went from locked out, lock, lockdown to secure. We dropped the lockout. We thought secure was a better way. I love you guys foundation came in and suggested that. Uh, we took it, uh, we've updated that. So securing the campus, what does that mean? Well, say, for example, we have um, police activity in the area of a school. We want to make sure that doesn't migrate onto our campus and, and make it unsafe and somehow or another somebody get, you know, into the school uh, that shouldn't be there. Uh, they, can, they secure the campus. Everything's locked down. SRO's on notice. Staff is on notice. Hey, something's going on. Make sure the campus is secure. Now, we keep the school going, and we're always in a position to say, hey, lock down the school at any time but it's just a way to make sure that we're prepared if something were to happen. So that's just an example of our standard response protocols and some of the work they've done to update that. Uh, plans for this year, including um, Senate Bill 590 requirement for ESE accommodations into our drill procedures. You might, you can might imagine what kind of complexity that can have. So uh, they're uh, working on that. Uh, they have updated our active assailant hostage situation training which we do on an annual basis at every one of our schools. Uh, they've included our Alyssa's Alert notification system into our emergency procedures manual. And they also uh, had their preparedness days over the summer. So it gets those administrators ready for emergencies on their campus when they host the preparedness days. District police and our team's involved in that as well. Let's talk a little bit about the FSSAT. It is a handful, I want to assure you. It's called the Florida Safe School Assessment Tool. We're required to have one completed for every Orange County public school, including our charter schools. Uh, this is a very extensive uh, safety, security, emergency management assessment for every one of our school sites. And as you might imagine, this is not the forte of our school administrators, but they're required to complete it. So what do we do? We help them. We assist them by, by providing them a reference guide and support material so they can complete it. It's really important we do this well because this is what drives our grant funding. If it's not mentioned or is inaccurately reported in your FSSAT for your school, you're going to be out of luck for grant funding. 
they go back up at FDOE and check and see if what you said you're asking for is consistent with what's in your FSSAT. And as you might imagine with the number of schools we have, 205 school sites, uh, plus some other additional is required, um, you've got to make sure it's accurate. We're also required to do what's called a first responder safety tour. Once every three years, we invite law enforcement, and we alternate years when we do this, or our fire, to, fire departments from that agency that is the, the responding agency for that particular school into the school, and we let them go on a tour. We provide them a document. We ask them to add, you know, give us suggestions. Do you see something that you know, might make the school safer? Um, there might be some fire issues that the fire department might want, had, want to take a look at. Maybe some of the equipment needs to be updated, whatever it may be. We have them complete that. We have the administrator go on the tour with them. They complete that form. They send it back to us, and then we pull that all that information together and then start looking at that for the possibility of grant funding. So that's just a way we can get input from outside agencies on how we're doing in our schools and make sure they're as safe as possible. Let's talk about physical security improvements that uh, we have either made or we're in the process of, of uh, actually carrying out as we speak. So when I talk about physical security improvements, I'm not going to give you a lot of detail back to that whole idea. I don't want to do that, but I am happy to announce that our 270-degree fencing uh, project, which was funded by the previous board, is completed. I'm just <laughs> It's been a long, a long haul. We got fencing around our schoolyards, so I'm happy about that. Spent a lot of work on that, we did. Our Sally Point concept, we have 115 of our schools actually completed. Now, this is being funded by grant funding. Uh, what is the Sally Point concept? I'll tell you this. It's a multi-layered approach to physical security designs to eliminate un unauthorized access to our schools. And we'll just leave it at that, All right? So, school, oops, there we go, sorry about that, got a little behind. School radio system upgrades, our first responder radio systems, all schools meet transmission requirements. I uh, have to give the board chair some credit for this, she pushed hard for this. Thank you, board chair, we appreciate that, and uh, I'm happy to report they meet all requirements. Same thing for our school radio systems, you might imagine we want to make sure that our schools can transmit in and out of their uh, out of their school when they're in the school. If you've got somebody out on the playground, you want to make sure those radios are able to, to communicate with each other in the event you have an emergency. And I'm um, here to report that they meet all transmission requirements. But also through some numbers up here on the number of security cam cameras we've installed since 2020. Now. We do this on an ad needed basis. This isn't the VidCam refresh project where we were going in and taking all the old, uh, we had the, the, the old um, analog cameras in there and upgrading them to IP based cameras. That's not what this is. These are additional cameras that we've added to schools to provide for a safer school. The principals like it because they like, you know, they want to manage student, student management. We like it because of the security aspect and sometimes they intersect. Mind you, with that in mind, so you can see 803 cameras, new cameras, uh, replacing those analogs, and uh, additional card readers uh, at our schools that make it easier for the staff to get in and out of the school, um, you know, without having to have a key or propping the door open, using a chair, things of that nature. I'm always looking for that when I go out to a school for a tour because uh, it usually tells me, I think we need a card reader right here. So let's talk about uh, 2122. What do we recommend we do moving forward? Now, this is all tied again back to the Florida Safe School Assessment Tool. So, with that in mind, I'm going to read these off. We are recommending rooftop and classroom exterior building identification systems. We recommend that we enhance our no trespassing signage along our school per perimeter so it's in compliance with state law and how it's supposed to be posted. We would like to expand our public address systems to ensure we have full coverage. Now, for the most part, we do, but occasionally we'll have some spots of the school that we have some issues with, and we always want to make sure 
when we do this test and we test for this every year, can they hear you out on the school grounds? Can you hear it around the school? We always make sure we test at a very loud level. We're sorry for the neighbors at times, but we usually turn it up all the way to make sure they can hear it out in the event we have an emergency. It's really important that they can communicate to everybody on the campus. Uh, we would like to expand our exterior lighting systems. A little bit of light goes a long way with our new camera systems. I'll just leave it at that. If I need to, well, I'll just leave it at that. goes a long way. We also have a need-based expansion of our school security cameras and our access card readers. That's what we've been doing. You can see we've had to add uh, cameras and readers, and we've been doing that. And we want to continue with that. And we would like to evaluate a vehicle, uh, a vehicle barrier system for our schools. So that's just an evaluation process. We're not quite ready to commit to that, uh, but we're working with our facilities uh, services folks uh, on identi identifying a system that will work for at retrofitting schools that don't have uh, areas that are safe. So let's talk about the new legislation that we've had come out. Uh, first of all, we'll talk about Senate Bill 70, which is Alyssa's law or Alyssa's alert, as we like to refer to it here. This is actually a mobile panic alert system that's new for this year. It was funded by the state of Florida, and we're thankful for that. We have selected our vendor, Motorola Safer Watch, for our Alyssa's alert provider, and we are involved in the implementation. Now, the uh, Motorola Safer Watch has agreed to uh, work with us on what we would consider improving the application and making it fit with our standard response protocols that we have here. So they've been willing, they've, they've agreed to do that and we are involved in that as we speak. And um, I'm really happy uh, that they have been willing to work with that. Um, hopefully uh, we're, not, we're, we're not in a position where I'm concerned about a full implementation throughout this school year. We've already got it implemented, but full implement, implementation from my perspective is it's working the way we want it, and it works for all of our schools. Charter schools also received what we call their notice to proceed for this, and um, they're moving forward on their, their uh, Alyssa's Alert systems as well. Let's talk about Senate Bill 590, which was passed this year. Um, this involves a lot to do with the Baker Act. And uh, it does require notification that must be documented. It has to be documented by the school. Also requires the annually, re annually reporting the number of Baker Acts that happen per school. It requires timely notification to parents of threats. And these are threats to students. You can see it up on the screen, specific unlawful acts and uh, significant emergencies. Now, the, par the parents are also have a right to access the school safety and discipline incidents. They have a criteria for selected criminal offenses to be resolved with civil citations. They have a criteria for petty acts of misconduct to be resolved with school interventions. And last but not least on this slide, that students ID 6 through 12 are required to have what I mentioned previously, that crisis hotline number on the back and that information. I'm going over this in detail for you because we're gonna have some policy work to do, but I am happy to report that the last three criteria that we have up there, actually, um, excuse me, the, uh, the criteria for selected criminal offenses and the petty acts of misconduct is already built into our school justice partnership agreement. Now we're working on updating and upgrading that um, but with that said, it's already in there. I'm glad to report that, and we already have a mechanism in place to be able to just do an, an update, and uh, that'll be done. So let's talk a little bit about the FDOE Rule 6A because it gave us a lot of new requirements, and I'm here to tell you, school board, I'm going to need your support. We're going to need your support, and we're going to have to put our backs to the plow on this one because there's policy work to do. Um, we've already talked about it with our general counsel and uh, our legal team, and we have some new requirements that we've got to meet. Um, and these things are just, in, you know, there's a whole list of them up here, and I don't want to go into all of them in detail, but again, it's policy work, and we know how the policy project process can be 
So uh, stand by to stand by. Um, one thing I do want to mention, though, is that we must establish policies to identify any deficiencies in the school safety in, in, if, if a safe school officer doesn't show up at a school. So if we have an SRO that doesn't show up and we have a vacancy in a school for an entire day, I'm required as school safety specialist to report that to Office of Safe Schools. And I've got to provide them in writing what the remedy is going to be to fix that. We can't let that just move, go forward. Uh, this not only applies to our schools, but it applies to our um, charter schools as well. So that's just an example of it, but there's other items in here too. Requires that we actually put into policy uh, the, that the SSO coverage outside of a regular school day and what that looks like. So before and after school. It's got to be in policy. Summer school. Are we going to have SSOs on our campus? Extracurricular activities. School-sponsored events. Football games. Things of that nature. We've got to build that into policy and what the requirements are going to be for that. So there's obviously going to have to be a lot of discussion about those type of situations. We must also maintain current contact information uh, in Fortify, Florida for each school administrator. So there's just, you can see there's a lot of detail in here. And I don't want to beat it up, but there's, there's quite a bit to this uh, Rule 6A. There's also requirements for our school threat assessment teams. Uh, again, we're already doing most of this. The issue we have is strictly getting it into board policy. We must meet at least monthly, must have at least one administrator, one educator, and all those uh, uh, attached to the team, establish training requirements for our staff members. What does that look like? And then beginning in 22-23, districts must report the race, gender, and grade level of each person who has made a threat. We also have some SESA requirements. This goes back to the School Justice Partnership ag Agreement. Again, having that in place is helpful. So uh, we're not going to have as much work to do when it comes to that. Charter schools have some requirements as well. Uh, simple, they, they must make sure they provide contact information to me. <laughs> so you see they go into a lot of detail on this, but some districts might have issues with this. We do not. I'm proud to report that our, our charter schools um, are very responsive and work closely with us to make sure that they're in compliance with their requirements. So let me talk about uh, what I call my findings and then, of course, some recommendations. I find that we are meeting or exceeding the requirements put forth by the Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Act and these su subsequent laws that I mentioned to you. Remember, this implementation is ongoing. Uh, a lot of it is already done, but all of it doesn't have to be done immediately. It has to be done by the end of the year. Alyssa's alert is a good example of that. It has to be done by the end of the school year. The caveat to this, School board policies need to be established and or amended. Let me talk a little bit about my recommendations. A lot of this is keep doing what we're doing. I think we're doing a fantastic job here at Orange County Public Schools. Establish a policy directing uh, the school safety specialist to develop school security procedures. I talked to you about this in the meetings that we have. I would like the board to establish a policy that we create procedures that uh, have the force of the board policy behind it. So my idea for this was with the advice and consent of our legal counsel and the superintendent, we have school safety and security procedures. Now we push them out every year, but they're not backed by board policy. That's something I would like to see built into this. That said, well, I'd like to, us to continue maturing our competency-based competency emergency preparedness skills amongst our district personnel. Let's, keep, let's get better at what we already know where to do, but let's get better at it. Continue to conduct our annual district-wide active assailant and hostage situation training and our active assailant response plan training. Emergency management helps us with all that. Continue to mature our emergency pre preparedness program to include family reunification. It's super important to do that well. If you have to evacuate a campus, and you have a reunification issue, 
and you don't do it well, the parents will never forget it. They're going to be in here filling this room up, and we're going to get an earful. We need to do that well. We need to practice that. And then uh, last but not least, continue enhancing our school emergency con uh, communications along with our electronic and physical uh, security infrastructure. I already talked about that earlier and what we're recommending we, we do moving forward with our security programming. So grant funding, we have received $14,525,225 worth of grant funding. We're expecting another $3 million this year. With that in mind, we're working on spending it. <laughs> we want to spend all of it. Those projects that I've been t talking about in there, that's what we've been working on. And uh, our asset protection, our facilities teams are doing a great job carrying it out and getting the job done. Uh, back to the, we have grant number four. We have to share that with our charter school so they get a they get a piece of that as well, but that's fine. And we'll make that three million bucks go, uh, our piece of that three million dollars go as far as we can uh, on these projects that I mentioned to you previously. With that said, superintendent's comments, and any questions? Member Gallo, are you with us? Thank you, Chief. Member Gallo with us? Member Gallo, you have comments or questions? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, wonderful. Um, yes, yes, I do. So I just want to thank um, Chief Holmes and his team for, for the work that they've done on our behalf and the staff's behalf, behalf this past year. Uh, when 590, when that bill dropped and all the student safety language was um, added, it was great language and a lot of it we had already laid out here in Orange County and we were kind of the front runners in that. So I'm just thankful to his team and for all that they continue to do to keep us and everyone in OCPS safe. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Member Gallo. Any other comments or questions from board members? If not, let me echo the words of Member Gallo. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Thank you for the job you and your whole team do every day to keep our, our students safe, to keep everyone safe here in Orange County Public Schools. Um, I'm, I'm glad the focus over the last year, as difficult as it has been, has not been on the types of violence that we've seen in schools around the country um, over the last 10 or 20 years. So, And I know that your presence, the presence of our SROs at all of our schools, that all of those pieces of the chain, as we talk about chains that keep our community and our, and our society safe, all those links of the chain are critical to it. And every single man and woman that works for you is a critical part of that chain. So thank them for us, please. Thank All right, you. with that, we will move on then. Thank you again, Chief. We're going to move on to the adoption of the agenda. Dr. Jenkins, any changes to the agenda as published? No changes, Madam Chair. All right, seeing no p changes to the agenda, I will um, offer a, w I'm sorry, um, request a motion to adopt the amended, uh, the agenda as proposed. Um, motion by member. Lopez, seconded by Member Colbert. Thank you. I wasn't quite sure who I heard and who I saw. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Member Gallo? Aye. Motion. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. And um, we should not have any public comment, I don't think, because we don't have any action items. So with that, we will. I will request a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move to approve Motion by Member Castor Dental, seconded by Member Byrd. All in favor, please say aye. Member Gallo? Aye. Motion carries Aye. unanimously. Now you're coming through fine. Thank you, Member Gallo. And thanks for always participating, even when you're on the road. We appreciate it. And so the motion carries unanimously. Dr. Jenkins, you're recognized for a superintendent's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I will be brief. Um, as October 30th approaches, I know parents and staff uh, want to know if we will continue our face mask mandate or revert back to required masks with the parent opt out provision. While I must say the numbers look extremely encouraging, I want to review this week's information before making a final determination. Tomorrow, Mayor Demings has a press conference schedule that should provide updates. I will be talking to Dr. Shu, Dr. Pino, Dr. Rodriguez, and who is our OCPS physician consultant, and with each of you over the next two days. I plan to announce the face mask direction on Thursday. That is my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. And Member Kester Dunnell? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to comment on um, 
uh, the superintendents and just give some of my thoughts on that um, her decision that's coming. Um, I looked up uh, the CDC uh, recommendations to see if they had changed since our um, last mask policy was implemented. And the CDC continues to recommend that uh, masks be worn indoors at school for everyone, um, even though our numbers have improved. Um, and uh, if you listen to the discussion of the Medical Advisory Committee, you would have heard the overwhelming majority also recommend that we continue our mask use. And fortunately, our high school students have had access to the vaccine for some time, but none of the thousands of elementary students in our schools have. Um, finally, vaccines are on the horizon for elementary and middle school kids and likely will be available in a matter of weeks. But until that time, uh, masks are the only measure that our unvaccinated children have to protect them in our school. <coughs> I'm sorry, you're out of order. You're out of order. Please do. Perfect. Thank you. Ma'am? Cut. She doesn't have a mic to cut. So finally, uh, vaccines are on the horizon for our elementary and middle school kids and will likely be available in a matter of weeks. But until then, um, Masks are what we have to protect our kids. Um, we know masks work. <laughs> and again, masks, excuse me, this is my time to speak. Masks work best when everyone wears one. And I admit that masks can be inconvenient, but they're practical and a simple way to mitigate the spread of a disease. And I recognize that this is a highly charged issue and one that we have never seen uh, the likes of before during our board meetings. Um, and like you, I've received very angry emails from some folks, but the majority of my emails are from grateful parents and teachers. And when I'm in the community and at different events, friends and strangers alike come up to me and express their appreciation for the steps that this board has taken to protect our community. And I think that's important to know as we go forward. As we just listened to Chief Holmes detail the many layers of safety, which takes expertise in security measures, tremendous fiscal resources, 14 to 17 million, he mentioned, um, the cooperation of every department we have, every adult, every student on our campuses. I was so thankful for the commitment that OCPS has and the superintendent and this board has, has made to put safety first. There were, just to recap, an SRO in every school, Sally Ports in every school, fencing, cameras, monthly drills, radio system upgrades, threat assessment teams, our own police force, card readers at every door, upgrades to lighting, upgrades to vehicle barrier systems, expanded public address systems, rooftop building IDs, background checks for every volunteer and employee, mobile panic alerts, mental health training. I say all that just to put this mask mandate into perspective. It requires minimal, if any, more dollars. It achieves the same goal as all of those other measures I just mentioned and that Chief Holmes mentioned. It keeps our kids safe. I would like to propose maintaining our mandatory mask policy with medical opt-out for our K to eight students for just six more weeks so that they have the time to get vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Member Castro Dental. Member Gould. Uh, thank you. Um, and 
I, I appreciate um, Member Castor Dental's uh, reflection on this. I, I also am looking forward to hearing the the new um, update that we will probably receive tomorrow or Thursday on where we are because the trends have been going in the direction that we had hoped with mandating it across the board. Um, you know, I I from what I'm learning through m my medical resources is that we will be below um, perhaps even 4% tomorrow, which would be fantastic. Um, and that the vaccines are going up and that's exactly the way we wanted the scales to tip. So um, I, I would like to point that out and I, I am glad to hear that the superintendent is is um, giving this, uh, you know, kind of a thoughtful data look because that's what we need to be driven by. And that um, even if this mask policy does expire, I think that people who are uncomfortable um, and want to follow the recommendations of the CDC would continue to do so and, and mask up. So that, um, I am anxious to hear the direction that we go, but uh, I am still in support of the original policy. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, let, let me make a, a few comments. Um, I, don't, I don't disagree with anything that, that Member Kester Dental just said, but it does omit some important facts, and I think that they need to be in the record as well. At the time when this board voted to amend our policy to make it purely optional with the ability to pivot to something more restrictive, we were at about 160 cases per 100,000. At that time, there was no state rule in place that prohibited us from doing that. A few weeks later, the governor in response to, I believe it was Duval, Alachua, and maybe Miami-Dade County, issued an order, and a week later, the Department of Health issued a rule, Department of Ed issued a rule. At that point, we were at 574 cases per 100,000. At that point, I personally believed that we needed to move forward with a mandatory mask pivot, even though there was a rule, something I have never in my entire professional career ever considered. And I only considered it and supported it and advocated strongly for it because the numbers were so high and continuing to rise that it was s a, literally a life and death situation as I viewed it. And I also believed, as you all know, that the rule that was adopted did not comport with the requirements of adopting a rule. But still, there was a rule in place. So without a rule in place, at 160 cases per 100,000, the board went with purely optional. We are now at 69 cases as of last week, and there is still a rule in place. And while I would like very, very much to be able to extend this for another six weeks, weighing that risk at 69 cases, by the way, when we were at 574, 600, we were also looking at hospitals that were at capacity, that could not, that were turning away, people that were turning away elective surgeries because of the capacity issue. Mm -hmm. So today we are looking at a governor who is calling a special session in November to cure the one problem they have with the rule. It's a simple problem. There's no legislative authority in the Parents' Bill of Rights. And all they need to do is give that legislative authority and it cures all the litigation that we've also, by the way, entered into a lawsuit with other counties suing the state, something that is also extremely rare against their rule. That is almost 
certainly going to be cured in the next couple of weeks. That lawsuit goes away. And the question I, I struggle with is whether or not us continuing to proceed forward with the mandate we have in place with numbers that are less than half of what they were when we went purely optional in spite of a rule with a special session being called to figure out how to deal with belligerent boards, which is how they'll be seen by the legislature, by those in power in the legislature, whether that results in, since they've tried financial sanctions and it hasn't worked, what other sanctions are there? And does removing this board from office, and I know I will read this on social media and I will regret that I was honest with the public because social media won't be honest with me. I don't care about being removed from office. I do care about having a puppet board. And I think every person that cares about having a mask mandate in place and wants to extend it needs to be concerned about what happens if this board gets removed because we are seen as belligerent for not backing off at this stage of the game. So if this board gets removed and we have another spike, then you have the governor's appointees. That's how it works until the next election in next November. We go through the whole next year with the governor's appointees sitting up here, and they will not give one flip about what anybody who believes in masks wants. So is that a risk that is worth taking for the children of Orange County Public Schools? Yes, the folks in the green agree it is. And when you're in this position and you have this option, you will make the decisions you believe are right, and this board will make the recommendations they believe are right. But I do want to share why it is that I'm not doing what my heart wants badly to do, which is give us six more weeks. I think we also need to recognize the risk of what happens during those six weeks. If I thought we had, I thought the governor wasn't going to go forward with the special session because he didn't pull it off the last time he offered, to, suggested to, excuse me, suggested he was going to do that. But he is doing that. And I think that that is, puts um, a very different spin on what our actions need to be so that we are still poised in the event that we have another spike to put another mandate in place. But that's only going to happen if this board is still in office. So I do, and I also think that the governor trying to remove, to trying to get something passed to remove the board is going to be hard to do if boards across the state that put them in at levels of 600 people per 100,000 and took them out at 60 people per 1,000, I think it's a much harder case. I hope it's a much harder case. I hope it preserves the ability for this board over the next six months to a year to do what they believe is best for our children and then for each board member here to decide whether they wish to seek re-election or not under their own terms and under the terms of our citizens. So that's, that's the, the weighing that I do back and forth. I look forward to hearing the numbers tomorrow and the recommendations of the superintendent as well. But those, that's the battle that goes on in my mind. And so everything you said, as I said, I, I completely agree. I just struggle with what are the consequences of that action. And are those consequences for our students the is are we making the best choice for our students? Not for us. So thank you. Thank you, Member Kester Dunnell. And and I appreciate, as I always do, your perspective. Let's hear from Member Gallo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I I appreciate the remarks that, that you made and the information mm -hmm. that you gave us. And I also appreciate um, Member Dr. Pastor Gentle and her perspective as well. I, I agree with Member Gould. I'm very encouraged by the numbers, and I'm looking forward to the information that Dr. Jenkins will gather um, over the next day or two, and I'm looking forward to her recommendation on what um, the, the county and the, and the experts say. So I just wanted to say thank you to, to everyone, and I look forward to hearing the information that we gather. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gallo. Um, Member Lopez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, no, I, I agree with um, school board member Karen Caster-Dental. If you ask me today, 
um, I would recommend um, for the extension to have the mask mandate based on the CDC recommendations and based on the discussion from the Medical Advisory Committee. But I also want to know um, tomorrow's press conference. I also want to know more discussion with the Department of Health. Um, so, um, but at this moment, if you ask me, you know, I, I think that is not fair for our um, students that are not able to get vaccinated to be exposed. Um, so I am very concerned about that. I don't know if the other option is surgical. At this moment, you know, I cannot discuss that because we have the option for um, 15 years old and older, but for elementary school, you know, and, and part of middle school, um, for me, is very concerning. So that is my, my opinion. Thank you, Member Lopez. I, I have a couple of questions for um, Dr. Jenkins. Uh, one concern that um, I, I know an awful lot of us have is the, the fact that uh, the Department of Health, when they revised their rule, also made quarantining optional. Dr. Jenkins and I had an opportunity to talk about um, this earlier today, and I don't know if it's happening yet, but I would really like to see the communication to our parents be extremely clear that if they get notice that there's a child in the classroom um, who has tested positive, that the parents know that not only their child may have been exposed, but that any child who has been exposed is still allowed to come back in the classroom. And the reason I think it's important for those parents to know is because if I were a parent, I would, I would want to know so that I could decide whether I just wanted to self-quarantine my child. And, um, and I think that we owe it to parents to make sure that there's no, we can't change what the Department of Ed has done, but I think informing parents can, it's the most that we can do to protect our students. So Dr. Jenkins, um, we, you're, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but you would agree we can make sure that we communicate that? not a problem we can okay. and then uh, I also asked dr. Jenkins if we have students that um, parents that want to keep their students home because of, of the lack of a mask if we can do everything that we can to accommodate those students while they're out while they're waiting for the opportunity for a mask um, I know that nothing is the same as being in the classroom but if assuming that at some point we lift the mask mandate and vaccines aren't available, and that will depend upon what happens this week with numbers and what superintendent decides to do and what input she receives. But if and when that happens and the vaccine for 12 and under, I'm, I'm hoping and praying it's gonna be approved in the next day or two, but when will it actually be available for students is another matter so I would like to, to have comfort knowing that we're going to do what we can to accommodate the academic success of our students if parents feel compelled to keep their kids at home. Dr. Jenkins. Certainly so depending on the outcomes and the announcement on Thursday we would always make provisions for uh, parental concerns and preferences it just be a matter of coordinating it with their school. Thank you. Okay. All right, if there's no further comments on this subject, and again, Dr. kester I, I raised the other issue just because I want to make sure that as people are following what we're doing that they understand the full context of the, 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 the de decision-making process. Dr. kester uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I, I appreciate um, the full context that you gave because um, we are... Um, we are not able to be um, autonomous on this issue and on the board without consequence. So we've been weighing the consequence personally, and um, even then we're still we've moved forward. But um, but your point about the um, the potential for the governor to remove us, although it might be, uh, we, you know, we might not want that. Um, but it's not, it's not our personal, ourselves being removed, but who would come and be appointed um, in our place by the governor would have um, effects that 
that we can't even predict right now that go f beyond the mask controversy and others. So, I mean, that that is a, a, a real concern. I mean, our, our governor has, has shown um, what he's willing to do, and um, I don't... I don't take that lightly, um, but I, I, so I understand your concern, and I appreciate your perspective. Thank, Thank you. you. And I, I'm going to make one other comment just for the public, because I have gotten a number of emails from people saying the governor hasn't removed anybody from office yet, and so I'm just, you know, imagining something. I, I want to be clear, the governor doesn't have the authority to mo remove anybody today. He needs that authority from the legislature. He doesn't have it, and he and if he tried to remove anybody based on um, the Parents' Bill of Rights, there's there's such an issue there. So I, I think that's exactly why the governor is calling a special session because he needs some legislative changes in order to make that possible. So then the question is, what is that risk? Anybody who knows me, I'm not a I'm I'm a rather risk averse person. And um, when I weigh those two risks, I do worry tremendously about what, the dis what this district's future looks like for our students with a fully appointed board for the next year. Without any further, Member Lopez, and then we'll um, move on to next item. Member Thank Lopez. you, Madam Chair. I, I just have a question to the superintendent. So once um, she knows the feedback from the Department of Edu the, the Department of Health, I'm sorry, and also from um, tomorrow's um, feedback from Mayor Demings, how is going to look, you know, the decision? Because we have until the 30th. And, you know, we o only a few of us, you know, provide recommendations publicly. How is going to work um, in order for you to make the decision based on our recommendations and on the feedback that you receive from, from the people that I already told you? Member, uh, Dr. Jenkins. Uh, absolutely, uh, Member Lopez. Actually, it does not take board action or a board vote. I have that authority. I'll be speaking with individual board members and certainly would convey to you my decision prior to announcing it to our parents and our community, hopefully on by Thursday. So it's, so it's based on your decision after you analyze that to then call us? Correct. To, okay, perfect. Thank you. Miss um, uh, Enval, do you have a legal counsel report. I think I you have an announcement have for us. I two things that I wanted to discuss. I will try to make them brief. The first is an announcement of an executive session pursuant to section 286.0118 Florida statutes and in accordance with board policy BEC, an entity may meet in private with its attorney to discuss pending litigation to which the entity is presently a party before a court or administrative agency, provided certain conditions are met, including the requirement that a transcript of the executive session will be made part of the public record upon conclusion of the litigation. In this case, I'm requesting the school board's advice concerning pending litigation in our recent rule challenge case, which is styled as school board versus Miami-Dade County et al., in which we're a party, versus the Florida Department of Health in DOA case number 21-3066-RE. On Tuesday, November 2nd at 1 o'clock p.m., the executive session will be a closed meeting held in conference room E at the ELC and will take approximately one hour and a notice has been drafted for posting. Those in attendance will be Teresa Jacobs Chair, Pam Gould Vice Chair, Angie Gallo School Board Member, Johanna Lopez School Board Member, Linda Covert School Board Member, Vicki Elaine Felder School Board Member, Karen Castro Dennell School Board Member, Melissa Bird School Board Member, Dr. Barbara Jenkins Superintendent, Amy Enval School Board's General Counsel, John Palmerini Deputy General Counsel, and a court reporter. Thank you, Madam Chair, that's my first thing. And my second item is uh, to give you an update on the Reapportionment Advisory Committee. I have to commend your selection of representatives for the Reapportionment Advisory Committee. I am so pleased with their passion, with their excitement to draw maps. Um, <laughs> and it's really nice to focus on something that's different than, you know, so it's, it's been a lot of fun. Our first two meetings were here, held here at the RBELC. Um, and Chair Jacobs did a welcome for all of them. We took our uh, show on the road to say <laughs> our meeting number three was at Windermere High School, where Pam Gould gave an address to um, the members. We had about 20 to 30 attendees, and they were just watching from the audience, so it was very mm -hmm. exciting to watch. Uh, this week, we're going into, uh, uh, we're going to be at Lake Nona High School tomorrow night, where Member Lopez is going to join us. And uh, next week, we're going to be at Hedgewater High School on November 3rd, and Jones High School on November 4th. 
And so um, uh, creating new maps to reapportion the population into as equal as possible member districts is our goal, keeping a variety of legal principles into consideration. This is not changing the boundaries of schools. So I need to make sure that that's clear. Um, for the public, I encourage you to go look at our website. You can watch our meetings. You can listen to the audio. You can review all our materials. You can evaluate the current maps that we have of the district boundaries. You can read the FAQs. As we get multiple questions, we're adding them to the FAQs and updating them regularly. Um, you can view our meeting schedule and you can submit electronic comment. And we, of course, welcome anyone to come in person to any of those meetings, even if you're not residing in that district. And I look forward to continuing to work with such a remarkable group. Thank awesome. You. Thank you. I totally agree with you. They were, I was so impressed when I walked in because um, I, I, I must know at least half of them. And I was really, thank you all for the caliber of people that you, um, that you volunteered for this. All right, Member Lopez, I think this was press from before. Yes. All right, thank you. Then we're going to hear from our vice chair. Well, thank you, and, and I just want to encourage people to really participate and pay attention, especially if you care if we are elected or not in the future, because this is the boundaries that really have influence on that. So if you want to have a say, this is the time. <laughs> um, that's not why I wanted to talk, though. Um, it, so we are at a time where the Foundation for Orange County Public Schools is doing their employee giving uh, campaign, and and the board has traditionally been leaders in participating in that campaign. Um, it is a wonderful opportunity to either give a one-time gift or give through your paycheck um, and really make an impact in your schools or for one of the partner organizations that you can designate like United Way, United Arts, United Negro College Fund, a gift for teaching. Um, and our foundation for OCPS. Um, I split my giving. Most of it does go to the foundation for OCPS. I'll tell you that. But um, you know, there uh, I also have a heart in the arts, as you know, and, and roots in the arts. And so I give a small portion to that just to to keep through this and then through other entities. Please look in your email. Um, for the message from Debbie and um, make a difference because that uh, unified giving is really important. At one point, which I thought was kind of cool, we all agreed amongst ourselves that we would give something. Not It, not, it doesn't matter the amount of the gift. It's the fact that we were going to give. And we actually signed a document together that um, then was shared with employees and with our partners in the community who we asked to step up all of the time. So those of you who know that I work in the philanthropic world, the first rule is we have to give if we expect others to give. So please give. Nice job. All right, if there's not any further business to come before the board, then this meeting is adjourned.